Uh, thank you very much all for coming to our Frontiers in Biostatistics seminar. This is our first seminar of the semester, and it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce and welcome here Dr. Ilana Ferdig. She's a professor of oncology and professor of biomedical engineering. She's a division director of oncology quantitative sciences and associate cancer center director of quantitative sciences at the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins. She is a co-director of the Convergence Institute and also a co-director of the Single Cell Training and Analysis Center. Dr. Elana Furtick holds a bachelor's degree in physics and mathematics from Brandeis University and master's degree and PhD degrees in applied mathematics from University of Maryland. She joined the Department of Oncology at Johns Hopkins in 2008 as a postdoctoral fellow and then as an instructor in, in 2010. And then she's been thriving there ever since as evidenced by her very fruitful and very successful career. Uh, her work is at the forefront of all the omic technologies that you can imagine. She advances a new predictive medicine paradigm in oncology by converging systems biology with translational technology development. And her computational work combines rig rigorous mathematical modeling as well as artificial intelligence for biomarker developments as well for understanding the drug resistance, disease progression, and so on. She's developing methods and software and applications in the analysis of the single cell and spatial transcriptomics in particular. She also has a wet lab where they study the uh, time kind of dependent activation of pathways and whatnot. And uh, today she will be telling us about forecasting for pancreatic carcinogenesis from spatial multi-omics. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today. I really appreciate it. Um, and I see that, that um, you know, there's people in the room, obviously this is a hybrid talk. Um, I very much prefer talks that are more interactive. So if folks have questions, please feel free to ask along the way and don't hold up and everything till the end. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about some newer work that we've been doing, um, looking at spatial multiomics and trying to integrate those technologies with computational models and mathematical modeling approaches for forecasting um, as we think about how do we start understanding how tumors really progress and are there computational tools that we can use to start building that. So just briefly my disclosures. <clears throat> so I think probably everyone who's here in this room can appreciate that we're really in a technologic boom in biomedical sciences. And it poses an exceptionally um, exciting, for me, I find it very exciting, opportunities that we can really uncover features in cancers or in other biological systems at scales that were really never feasible before. And there's, you know, this pervasive notion of a precision medicine paradigm that we can use high throughput technologies, figure out what's the cellular state of tumors, what's the molecular state, and try to match that to therapies that then are active in a patient that would then treat a patient's tumor at that time. I think everyone in this room can really appreciate that there's a lot that goes on under the hood in getting to that mechanistic understanding and linking to therapeutics, right? You get the high throughput data, but then what do you do with it once you have it? How do we interpret it into something meaningful? And I would argue that developing computational methods is really part of the forefront of modern cancer science and that you can't have one without the other. And the three major themes that I like to think about, though there's several others that you know many people are advancing, are can we start to understand fundamental biology as computational scientists, right? So fundamentals of tumor evolution, cellular architecture, regulatory biology, all of these are uncovered by using computational methods on these new technologies. And many of these methods are not yet fully developed or fully robust to figure out which techniques should we be using. So um, as Svetlana knows, because we were postdocs together back in the day, um, and so she got to see me sort of transition fields, I came to the computational biology from a background in weather forecasting. Um, and that's really always informed how I've thought about computational biology, where I haven't really been able to do well, everything we can in weather yet, 
But I feel like we're just now getting to that precipice today. And that's some of what I'll hope to talk about. Where if you look at weather, the way that the forecasts are made, and I realize in Boston, it tends to be a little bit less accurate than in other places. So bear with me. But the way that those are made is that we have mechanistic understanding of how the atmosphere is going to move, is going to evolve in time that we can write down in the systems of, of equations. But of course, it's a chaotic dynamical system. So that means it deviates over time. So what do you do? You get in high throughput observations of the system, integrate them in with that mechanistic understanding through techniques called data assimilation. And that's what gives enhanced prediction accuracy in weather. And so my vision has long been, we're thinking about this precision medicine paradigm, right? Where we're trying to sort of match therapeutics to tumors based on these high throughput technologies. But if you think about what happens in a cancer, it's often not the cancer that you're presented with that's the issue, right? In some cases it is, but in many others, it's the metastasis that develops later on. It's the resistance mechanism that develops to a therapy. And so I've long thought, why are we taking this precision medicine approach where we're looking at tumors at the time of diagnosis to base therapeutic decisions when what's really impacting and causing worse prognosis for patients is what's gonna happen in the future in their tumor. And we need to start get at what is going to be going, how do we understand that mechanistically in the future to start thinking about interception strategies that are going to intercept the future progression of the tumor as opposed to where it is now. And the challenge in computational biology has always been, we don't have enough data, right? Or the mathematical models are too simple. And so that was always where sort of I was hit at this, that this will never be possible. And one of the things that I've been most excited about in the single cell and spatial revolution is it feels like we actually are getting to a point where it's possible, right? We're actually now starting to get real cell level measurements of tumors, you know, even systems that are starting to be dynamic, where we can start to imagine how this paradigm would work. So I work in pancreatic cancer. Um, and forecasting pancreatic carcinogenesis, I would argue, um, is one of the most important things we can do for this disease. So the challenge with pancreatic cancer is that it's diagnosed very late stage, right? So typically when patients present, it's very late stage um, and there's nothing you can do. And this is something that, you know, I've seen personally in my own family in the last couple of months, and it's just devastating. And the challenge is that what happens is that the disease is almost silent. And if you look at, there's been a lot of recent literature, if you look at the aging pancreas in a healthy individual, there's hundreds of pre-malignant lesions within that individual, most of them will never progress to cancer. And so even if we had better screening techniques, it's very tricky because if you find these pre-malignant lesions, it's unclear what to do with them because most of them are gonna remain indolent. And you definitely don't wanna just remove somebody's pancreas, right, in order to avoid that, but the late diagnosis is so challenging in this disease. And one of the things that's also tricky is that when, it, when pancreatic cancer does become detected, it's a tricky tumor, right? Most tumors, you get this giant mass of tumor cells, right? And that's what you work with. Pancreatic cancer tends to be a very small proportion of tumor cells and what it does is co-ops the microenvironment so that it becomes very dense and fibrotic and very immunosuppressive, so immune cells can't get in. So this makes it very important to study not only the advanced tumors, but also the precancers and try to figure out what, how are they going to progress. So one example of doing this is some recent work that we've been doing in collaboration with the Jaffe Lab um, and work led by a graduate student, Melissa Lyman, and two um, early career faculty, Wan Jin Ho and Niha Zaidi. We started looking at spatial transcriptomics technologies of these precursor lesions and seeing, can we use space for time, right? So the trick with these precursor lesions is that you, because they're detected surgically, you tend to find them in, when you already have an advanced cancer, right? So you have the cancerous lesion. So the question is, can you take a sample from a patient and use spatial information where you have the normal duct, 
the precancerous lesion and the advanced tumor and use that spatial information as a surrogate for time and start to evaluate the immune system in different regions of these tumors to see how it's changing during progression. So Wan Jin Ho um, led the spatial profiling of this of these of a cohort of samples with a technique called imaging mass cytometry. And what we observe with that is, for example, looking at markers of T regulatory cells, which is a type of immunosuppressive T cell, as expected, we see that the number, the density of these immunosuppressive T regulatory cells increases over stages of pancreatic carcinogenesis as expected. So these spatial proteomics technologies are incredibly powerful because they give us an ability to profile in tissue at single cell resolution, what's going on. Their limitation is that they rely on prior knowledge and very well curated marker gene panels. And so you need to know what you're looking for going in. So in this case, we were looking to understand the T cells. We had a beautiful panel design, but how do we start getting deeper into these systems? So in order to start building a reference atlas where we can start to evaluate these things, Ben Kenny Coster and Jackie Zimmerman got together and started saying, okay, can we collate all the public domain single cell data of pancreatic tumors that was out there? And this was only somewhat because it was COVID and we were trying to figure out what to do, but also thought it would be useful as a baseline to start studying these samples. And of course, what do you do when you get single cell data? You get the data, you immediately start clustering all the cells, and then you get them to the same exact cell type labels that you would have gotten if you had a marker gene panel with a proteomics assay. So what's the purpose of these high throughput da data sets if we're not gonna leverage them for the full power of the high throughput information that they provide as we're trying to study the tumors and their evolution? So Aviv Regev um, had a beautiful review where one of the things that she talks about is because there's this high throughput information in single cell technologies, right? And you have, you're measuring the whole human transcriptome, the, the gene expression data that you get is actually leaving signatures and you have footprints in the high dimensional data, not only of what the cell subtypes are, which is where most of the effort is going into clustering, but also what's the phenotype of these cells? Where are they evolutionarily? Where are they in terms of their cell state? Where are they spatially? Each of these lives a footprint on the transcriptional data that we wanna start being able to detect in order to go deeper and to figure out what the molecular programs are of these data sets. So in order to start doing this, one of the things that Genevieve Stein O'Brien and my group um, noticed is that this notion of having these footprints of gene expression data is perfectly mirrored in the mathematics of matrix factorization, right? So if you imagine that you have a high dimensional data matrix, which here we've driven, drawn in this cartoon with a grand total of four genes just for visualization, right? You can very easily by eye in this four gene cartoon and let's say on the left are tumors and the right are normal samples and you have cells from each of those. You can very easily by eye see that there's some genes that go up and down in the first set of cells in the normals, some genes that go up and down in the second, and then some, everything else is just a linear combination of that, right? It's just using one program or another. And so then the trick becomes, how do you estimate the gene usage and the patterns from these high dimensional data in a way that reflects the distinct transcriptional axes of the high throughput data sets. And so in order to do that, we developed many years ago a, an approach called COGAPS, which we found spans scales very well to single cell data. And what it is, is it's a model where we model each, um, each um, gene expression value, and it's a non-negative matrix factorization method where each M element of the matrix has a gamma prior and the system is updated through a Markov chain Monte Carlo approach. So it's a Bayesian model. And what this model enables us to do is we put a hyperparameter on the shape of the matrix elements. And what this does is if you think about a gamma as a sum of exponentials, 
if this value is small, your matrix elements are going to be constrained to being very sparse, right? Because you're going to be like an exponential distribution. As this gets larger, you're going to be shifting more and more to the right, more and more normal. And so you're actually going to be constrained away from being sparse. So we like to think of this as a non-negative matrix factorization approach, which has an adaptive sparsity that's learned with the data. And this is what's made this approach so robust across different technologies, is that that sparsity hyperparameter is learned as part of the sampling phase and allows it to be sort of tuned as part of the sampling with each data set and each technology so that it can start to learn the features. So I've talked to you about my, you know, Coke apps, but what is it actually giving me if I start looking back at this pancreatic cancer system? And again, we wanted to study what's going on. And in this case, we wanted to start looking at what's happening in the epithelial cells that cause the malignant progression to pancreatic cancer. So we wanted to apply COGAPS to this reference atlas to the epithelial cells in this reference atlas um, that we obtained from public domain data. And interestingly, one thing to keep your eye out for is that some of the data sets all the epithelial cells were from true, you know, true normals, meaning they were from pancreatectomies for, say, pancreatitis. And some of the others were match normal, right? They were tumor adjacent and they were cells that happened to look more normal. When we apply our matrix factorization, and I show the weights of the patterns colored on the UMAP, and on the left, I show the enrichment statistics for the genes that are associated with each of them. What we observe is we observe an enriched pattern for estrogen signaling in KRAS, which we attribute to cellular proliferation pathways in a subset of the epithelial cells that are the tumor epithelial cells. And that trades off and is sort of mutually exclusive occurring with a different group of cells where we start to see more EMT and inflammatory signaling in those epithelial cells. And interestingly, start to observe that that same signaling program is occurring as a transition in the tumor adjacent normal cells, right? But not in the normal epithelial cells. So we wanted to understand, is this a trade-off that we're seeing between inflammatory response and EMT that then is giving rise to cell cycle? Or are these two like two completely mutually exclusive programs, right? How are they interrelated to each other? So in order to do this, we wanted to see, can we map these across stages of pancreatic cancer carcinogenesis, right? So the data I showed you in this analysis is, full, is fully from advanced tumors. What happens if I try to map this across stages of carcinogenesis? Now, the challenge is I would love to go through, dissociate all these samples from these different regions and run single cell and report back to you what happens. These lesions have to be diagnosed in FFPE, right? They're pathologic, they're lesions that are diagnosed by a pathologist looking at them in FFPE. So that means they're really not well suited to single cell technologies. I realize that 10X now has an FFPE based association kit. So maybe that's not as true as it was, but it's still very limited in terms of single cell profiling. So in order to overcome this, we collaborated with 10X um, and work led by Luciani Kagahora and started to see, could we get the new FFPE-based spatial transcriptomics technology? And this was before CytoSyst. So could we start getting this working in these pancreatic cancer, precancer samples so that we could start mapping and looking at these epithelial regulatory programs across the stages of carcinogenesis? So we were able, we were able with 10X to get this working. And the challenge was when we got the data sets, we started to observe that the clustering that we got in our single cell data did not reflect any structures that we observed in the pancreas, right? They were kind of all over the place in the samples. And the challenge of course, is that the spatial transcriptomics technologies tend not to be truly single cell level resolution. Well, what's interesting about them is that they are matched to the H&E image, right? So you have the image of cellular morphology, 
but then you can line up to the spots. So our collaborator, Ashley Keeman and Danny Wurtz's group had developed a machine learning classifier called CODA for pancreatic cells, where what it does is uses the H&E in order to automatically annotate different cell types. And so what we did is apply this classifier to the H&E to annotate the gross cell types, right? What's in the normal duct, what's in the precancer, what's collagen, et cetera, just at sort of a gross level. And then we can use the imaging information because we have true single cell resolution on the H&E to deconvolve the spots and figure out what the transcriptional profiles are of each spot because we know the underlying ground truth of what cell types are there. So with this, we were able to start isolating out of different lesions, regions that were strictly epithelial and can start to map transcriptional heterogeneity in the epithelial regions because we have the h &E to guide that. So now that we've done this and sort of had this foundation, we wanna see, okay, if we have this information, how do I relate what I observed in my single cell assay, which I'm hypothesizing is a feature of pancreatic carcinogenesis to these spatial data sets that we're getting. So Genevieve Stein O'Brien in collaboration with Loyal Goff developed a technique that we call Project R for transfer learning. And the notion of this is, let's say I have my matrix factorization approach, and I've estimated a series of continuous weights of gene signatures from the matrix factorization. Then if I have a new data set that's coming in, what I can do is query, basically run a, a regression of the gene signature in that new data set and query how much it's occurring there. And if we imagine sort of visually that we view each of the patterns, the gene expression weights that we define in our data sets as the lenses through which we view the system, we imagine this transfer learning, the project R, the regression, as how much, if we were to project the data into one of those lenses of one of those features, are we seeing in the new data set? So when we apply this to the epithelial cells in our precancer samples, what we can immediately observe is that again, this pro proliferative pattern is completely mutually exclusive with regions where we're seeing inflammatory signaling also in these new samples in these precancer samples. We, because we have the information about grade, we can also map these to grade. And I realized that these numbers, the N that we have is not glowing. So, you know, bear with me, but it was a hard experiment to get going. What we observe is that this proliferative pattern is clearly increasing as we go across stages of pancreatic carcinogenesis. There's a trend, though I'm not sure it will hold up in a larger cohort, towards decrease in this inflammation across stages of pancreatic, of this carcinogenesis but it is arguably a little bit more stable. So, which is consistent with what we saw in the single cell data where you have this consistent epithelial, this consistent inflammatory and EMT-like signal sort of across the tumor adjacent and, and tumor cells, but the proliferative signaling is really truly occurring within the tumor cells. When we looked at our system and looked what else is going on, right? Because I've talked all about the epithelial cells, but I told you in the beginning, and you can see, you know, very nicely on these slides, the epithelial cells are really only a small part of the sample, right? So we start to look at what else is going on using these CODA guided annotations from the H&E, as well as gene signatures. We start to observe dense regions of fibroblasts even surrounding the precancerous lesions. So we wanted to see, is there a relationship between these signatures that we're seeing and fibroblasts or other cells in the microenvironment? Of course, the limitation of this spot-based technology is immune cells are really teeny. And so you can tell that there's immune cells, but it's very hard to deconvolve to get accurate estimates of which immune cell types are there. <clears throat> So again, in collaboration with 10X, we worked with them on the new Xenium technology 
which has true single cell resolution because it's an imaging based technology and having a panel with immune cell classifications, epithelial cells. And then we were also able to prioritize because we customized some of the gene markers from um, the signatures that we learned from our matrix factorization to delineate proliferation from inflammation. And when we start looking at these just visually, we start to see that the inflammatory pattern is coming out so here's a pre, uh, precancerous lesion down here. And you can see the inflammatory pattern is occurring all out at the edge, right? It's not on the inner region of this lesion. And if we look at it, it's where the fibroblasts are, are also occurring. And when we went back to our single cell reference atlas and tried to see what cell types correlate with, these, with this pattern that we observe in the epithelial cells, this inflammatory-like pattern, we observed only one of our two data sets actually had fibroblasts. The pattern only occurred in that one, and it was correlated with the fibroblast composition. So the question is then, is this a technical artifact, right? Which is immediately where my brain goes as a computational biologist because I don't trust anything, or is it actually real signal in the data? So in order to start isolating this out and teasing apart what these effects are like, we worked again with Jackie Zimmerman and Rick Burkhart and work led by Sam Gwynn, another graduate student, where she developed a co-culture model in organoids where you can take human-derived biospecimens, dissociate them, and then reconstitute them with specific cell types in the microenvironment. So in this case, we look specifically at epithelial cells and fibroblasts together. And to see if they were real, we can also start getting gene expression data and start to look at our same patterns in these gene express in gene expression now in an isolated co-culture system where we know exactly what's been put in, as opposed to within the human tissue that's going to be confounded by a lot of different factors. And of course, I wouldn't be talking to you if it didn't work. But what we found is that when we looked at single cell data of this co-culture that this inflammatory pattern projected and was enriched in the co-culture within individual cells, and more importantly, across a barter panel of organoid lines, across the board, we observed this increase in this inflammatory and EMT-like program in co-culture, epithelial cells that were cultured with fibroblasts as opposed to ones that weren't, leading us to really hypothesize that this is something that is at least can be induced by fibroblasts in the system. So that sort of gets through the genomics component of this, where I think as a result of what we've found, we now have a new model, a hypothesis based on our data exploration, that epithelial cells can transition into tumor cells, which we would have expected. There's also mesenchymal cells that can appear and there's this EMT-like signature, both in the normal epithelial cells, as well as the epithelial tumor cells that arise from communication with the fibroblasts. So that's sort of the model that we learned from our data. And if I were a biologist, I'd probably be ending with a ton of experiments there, but I'm not, I'm a mathematician. So I'm gonna end with a bunch of modeling here. So what we wanted to start doing is see, can we start to predict what are the effects, now that we know this regulatory program, can we start to predict what are the implications of this, right? And start deriving some logical conclusions about what the tumor is gonna do using some of our theory background, using some of our mathematics background to see, well, if this is how the system behaves, what's gonna happen next? And start getting to this predictive medicine paradigm that I talked about for weather prediction where I now have a set of rules. I have a bunch of data. Can I start to bring these together to start getting to predictions? So in order to do this, we collaborated with Paul Macklin um, and work led by Jeanette Johnson and Daniel Bergman. And Paul has developed this very elegant agent-based math modeling tool called PhysiCell, where you can start to put in different um, cell-cell communication 
It has a bunch of Hill equations for what each cell is going to do, runs those through an agent-based model, and he's developed a very um, beautiful compute architecture for these that can run on the cloud for efficient and agent-based modeling at scale. And what he wanted to see is, can we start making these systems more accessible so that if somebody is building these models of how cells are communicating, can we feed them into an agent bot based model to try to see what are the implications of that and start developing a computational toolbox for testing hypotheses. So what Paul did um, in a preprint that we just put out um, last week, which I realize it's being hidden by this um, and sort of move it over if anybody's interested. Um, what Paul did is to change, edit the system to build a cell-based grammar where now you can literally just type in, in plain words, epithelial cells interact with fibroblasts and become more motile. And then start building out an agent-based model. It interprets those plain language rules into an agent-based model for simulation. And so what this does is start to provide a paradigm where we can develop these little cartoon networks that we get out of genomics or inference and start to think about, can we simulate these in models to see where this is going? So Daniel Bergman from my group wanted to see, okay, if I have these fibroblasts there and I'm hypothesizing that they're interacting to epithelial cells to cause them to become more EMT, which I'm gonna model as them being more motile, what are the implications of that on tumor growth if I start from a system with only normal epithelial cells? I'm going to play this forward in time. What we start to observe is that the blue cells are more motile, right? These are the ones that are transformed and they start growing out. <clears throat> and if you bear with me, so, and these are the fibroblasts. Now you start to see that they see colonies over time of malignant tumor cells that are growing, but are not motile. So you have this transition where the fibroblasts allow the epithelial cells to start exploring the space and then find a region that enables them to grow out and colonize. So this is a pretty cool cartoon, but we wanna start seeing what does this look like if we actually overlay this onto human tissue? And the good news is I have all this spatial transcriptomics data that I was telling you about. I know exactly where the fibroblasts are in that data because I have transcriptional signatures for them. I know where the epithelial cells are because I can map them. And I can start putting this onto pancreatic tumors and see what are the implications for progression. And can I start to build out and understand what are the progressive mechanisms if I assume there's only fibroblasts in the system. And so now I'm gonna let these movies play. And what you observe is they start out green because you have all these tumor epithelial cells. They transition to more blue, right? Which will be consistent with an EMT-like transition. And then what happens is gradually over time, they start to seed these colonies of, EM of green of these proliferating epithelial cells where in the region where you have less dense fibroblasts on the top, this happens faster. And this movie is going to take a little bit, probably longer than I will take to talk. But in this one that has denser fibroblasts, it takes longer, but it enables it to proliferate out into the edge more quickly. So even though it's taking longer for the, pro for the tumor to proliferate, it starts to seed out in the same way. And what's interesting is if you look at pancreatic cancer invasion, in transcriptional data and metastasis, what's been observed that people really sort of were trying to explain is that everybody thinks you have this EMT-like progression, right, where you have more epithelial-like progressing, proliferating cells early on, and then in the metastasis, you um, would see more mesenchymal cells. What this su suggests is that the EMT is a progression, but then when the metastasis to actually colonize, that metastasis itself is epithelial, which is what's been observed in the literature. Is this a closed environment or do you 
allow different cell groups to enter into this defense industry? This one is currently closed, um, but you could definitely allow other cells to come in um, at a certain rate. It's very flexible for what you do. Um, and we're going to start to look, looking at immune cells next is going to be our next obvious question with this. <clears throat> so where we did pivot instead, right, of looking at that is we wanted to see, okay, my whole purpose of this is to see, can I start to look at interceptions, right, interception strategies that are going to block the tumor growth. So my colleagues, um, Liz Jaffe and um, Lei Zhang ran a neoadjuvant clinical trial in pancreatic cancer where they compared two arms. One was a vaccine arm and one was vaccine and checkpoint. And because it's a neoadjuvant trial, they're able to resect the tumors after the treatment and collect them for genomic profiling of the tumors to start looking at what are the programs that are occurring between different treatment arms. So in this case, they flow sorted, um, because this was pre-single cell data that we got, they flow sorted the data, the cells that they obtained from these neoadjuvant samples and did bulk RNA-seq of different immune cells. And I was asked to sort of lead the gene expression analysis to compare uh, differences between these treatment groups. So Joe Tenderella, who led the analysis, what we observe is that if we look at vaccine alone, we observe a high proportion of naive T cells. This is by cyber sort analysis, trying to estimate the cell type proportions from this. And they become less naive CD4 cell cells with immunotherapy. So you see an activation of CD4 T cells as a result of immunotherapy treatment in these trials. <clears throat> If we look at clonal expansion for survival, on the other hand, of the, of the T cells, we observe really no change in CD4 T cell clonal expansion relating to outcome, whereas CD8 T cell clonal expansion is related to patient outcome. So the more clonally expanded CD8 T cells, the better patients are going to do, whereas the immunotherapy is really activating CD4 T cells which is consistent with what we would expect. Pancreatic cancer does not have a great response rate to immunotherapy, even when combined with vaccine. So we started looking at the gene expression profiles to compare the treatment arms. <clears throat> we observe an intense chemokine receptor binding with immunotherapy. What I wasn't expecting is that when we looked at the CD4 T cells, it was also related to a pathway related to lymphocyte chemotaxis and when we looked at the CD8 T cells, we saw that they were seeing a change in extracellular matrix. And if we looked at the monocytes, there was a huge neutrophil degranulation that was occurring from the addition of immunotherapy. So what this led us to hypothesize is that as the neutrophils were degranulating, they were laying down structures that were altering the ECM the CD4 T cells were releasing chemokines, which were causing the immune cells to be more motile, but attracted to the CD4s, and the motility would be blocked by the ECM. So this was our hypothesis about what was going on in the system. So we wanted to test it and see what are the implications if that is indeed the case in these tumors. So Jeanette went back to PhysiCell and started modeling that. We take these rules, and put them in. We left out the neutrophil degranulation. We just modeled that as ECM for now. And what we observe when we run this simulation is that the immune cells bunch up and don't enter the tumor. And interestingly, this has been observed in pancreatic cancer immunotherapy when you give vaccine that you can see activation of these immune aggregate structures within the tumor. You can start to observe that even though you don't have a real effect on tumor killing. So we wanted to see what is going to cause these structures to break up, right, or change. So Liz and Lay have another trial arm that they're looking at for the neoadjuvant clinical trial, looking at urelimab as a CD137 agonist. 
which is hypothesized to increase the functioning and regulation of T cells. <clears throat> so what Jacob wanted in my group said, okay, can we try to predict how the regulatory network is gonna change if we increase CD137 expression by giving this agonist therapy? So we went back to our trusty reference single cell RNA-seq atlas of pancreatic cancer. And from that, we were able to classify immune cells as CD137 high or low based on their expression and use a technique developed in the Elysia lab called Domino to try to estimate what is the ligand receptor signaling from immune cells to neutrophils if we look at CD137 high cells relative to CD137 low. And what we started to observe is that within the cells that are CD137 high, and of course, because this is immunology, the gene name has to be different from the protein name. So TNS, TFN, TNFRSF9 is CD137, forgive me, in my pronunciation as a mathematician. Um, what we start to observe is that there's increased interferon signaling in the cells that are CD137 high that are signaling to the neutrophils. So what we hypothesized is going on is that when you have CD137 high expression on those cells, they can have an independent release of interferon gamma as a cytokine that might cause them to traffic in a different direction. So now we're gonna apply this in our <clears throat> mathematical model to see what is the effect of cell motility. And if we imagine that PD-1 has an effect on the actual function of cell killing, right? You can only get cell killing if there's PD-1. I'm gonna play through these four different simulations of different treatments. And what you observe is that with vaccine alone, you start to get these aggregates. <clears throat> with PD-1, it can kill the tumors around the edge. With the CD137 agonist, you can start to traffic into the tumor. And with the addition of CD137, it can start to effectively kill intratumorally. And what's been really exciting too is to pair this, there was an independent clinical paper that came out of this um, trial where they actually saw for the first time two regressions and granted it's small, but seeing any regressions at all in pancreatic cancer to immunotherapy is relatively miraculous. So they are actually starting to see regressions related to this therapy. And I don't have the results here. I'll sort of end on this note, but we have matched single cell RNA-seq and TCR-seq where we can start to look at what are the changes that are going on between these trial arms and can I start to take the theory that I'm showing you of these mathematical models and link them back and go full circle back to the single cell data in order to actually validate them and get them to be beyond hypotheses, but actually get them to be systems that we could start thinking about in clinical decision-making. So with that, I'd sort of like to propose thinking about moving from precision to more of a predictive medicine paradigm where we're starting to think about using these high throughput data sets, not only for what information can we learn about the system now, but where is it going in the future and try to base therapeutic decision-making on that. Um, and of course, this requires intensive team science work. Um, I would not be here without my experimental and biological and clinical collaborators who are really able to provide this, these rich data sets and insights into the system that enable us to really model and start thinking about how do we use these in relevant ways. So that I'd like to thank all the members of my lab, funders um, and collaborators, um, and of course, happy to take questions. I have a question about Asian cells. Mm -hmm. So I um, have two questions. Mm -hmm. One is so the model that you um, graphically showed us. Mm -hmm. One is some um, regulatory um, arrows. Mm -hmm. You can see the chemokines and the structure. Yeah. Are they coming into the model as just set of string clusters, like, like repetitive, or what mathematical model? Was yeah, there, yeah, there's um, yeah, it's a an attraction and repelling exactly. So yeah, and they're diffusing out with the gradient. Um, so there's sort of a 
you have the cell, there's a diffusion model where you're, where you have the diffusion and then there's attraction. And I, um, confess, I don't know exactly which equations Paul is using for that. Um, and <clears throat> like we could dig that up. That was sort of his portion of it. Um, and this is sort of the beauty and danger of this approach is that you basically write that in, right? You would say chemokine attracts CD8 T cell and the model, and then the model is automatically formed. So as the bioinformaticist, I don't have to know that in order to use the model. As a mathematical biologist, that could be a little bit concerning because you, you know, it's a little bit black boxy. Um, but again, it's all open source and you can kind of also play with the grammar to customize as well. Okay. So second question I think I'm asking because I don't know the, the tumor visual. Mm -hmm. uh, but does the microenvironment form out of cell actually like really exploring and get, getting jammed in some vision instead of they're dividing, growing very viscously and then uh, just out of rigidity of some, let's say, tumor region, it just gets stuck. Because simulation seemed more like hope, your cells were free to go about and then getting jammed. And I wonder how much of a reality of the self-visuality is reflected in the simulation. I think you have both, right? I think you have both things occurring within the tumor. And I think that's where overlaying it onto the real tissue where you have really dense fibroblasts, right? So in this little cartoon, the fibroblasts are moving around like crazy. I don't think that's very realistic. I think fibroblasts are probably way more rigid than that and forming a structure. Um, I do believe that tumor cells have to have a mechanism to move, whether it can be anywhere in the tissue or it really has to be along, you know, sort of um, veins or systems that are trafficking. I don't know. Um, you know, we do, I think that we did get a little bit more realistic here where the system is really locked in by the fibroblasts and it doesn't have the full formation, um, this full sort of freedom to move, but your point is very well taken. We need to like get at more of what are the fine structures of cellular motility. Um, and I think again, you know, all models are wrong and some are useful. And so, I think this gives us a way of starting to explore what are the implications of our hypotheses. And if it's wrong, it's actually probably better, sorry, because we're able to start seeing where do we have incomplete knowledge, right? That we need to start really targeting experiments towards that. Um, but I agree with you. There's a lot more components than just these cells that we need to interject into these movies. And that's definitely something that my biology colleagues, I think it's a huge communication barrier is, you know, I think when you're running experimental biology lab, you're so used to thinking about, right, like, you know, what are all the pieces that are there? How is it really working? Abstracting it into sort of these cartoon models, I think can be, it's a tough cultural divide. Questions also uh, in these physical models, um, it's always compelling to see a simulation that, that produces a, a result that is sort of coinciding with reality. Um, how much tuning parameters are there? Uh, uh, is it adapted to, so are these are all these um, great constants in these equations adapted to the, to the system? <laughs> yeah, so there are a lot of parameters. A lot of it is what is the transition rates, right? So what is the transition? from normal epithelial to tumor epithelial, what is the transition of, um, you know, malignant epithelial of, you know, going from to become more motile to less motile and the rate of um, fibroblast deposition. And actually part of the reason the paper went up last week and not two weeks ago is that in the initial simulations Jeanette was doing, the tumors were starting to invade after two days. And I was like, even for pancreatic cancer, that's a little bit fast, right? It should be more on the time scale of months, right? And so we started playing with that. Um, I think that is the next big frontier is how do we actually inform the dynamic parameters, particularly, you know, I, I only in patients, I only have static snapshots. So we're thinking, could we use the organoids to start informing that? 
but then, you know, the organoids are also limited because they're not the true human system. So I think estimating parameters, sensitivity to parameters, all of those things are going to be critical components, but we wanted to build the framework first. So that also means that those transition rates, they, they are not known, but you just chose them to fit. Yeah, yeah so it could be overfitting, right? Like I, I will fully admit that. And so, again, we were sort of showing proof of principle here that we can do it, but, you know, a full parameter sensitivity, what are the implications of that? How does it relate to therapy? And, you know, again, starting to think about, can we map it back to some of these post-treatment data sets that we're getting um, and really do robust parameter sensitivity? I don't know how to handle it with the fact that we only end up, you know, because of reality, right? The patient's only going to come for surgery once. So we're not going to get multiple time points. Like, it's just not going to happen. I don't know whether radiomics is going to help us and be sort of an intermediary that we could start to get some of these rate parameters. Um, I mean, there's a lot of open questions here. I feel like I'm opening more questions than I'm solving, but that's probably not a bad thing as a researcher. Are there any realistic models in the world? There are. Um, <clears throat> so there's a... Um, a inducible um, model of um, KRAS induction that forms pancreatic carcinogenesis. So that's exactly where part of what I'm thinking too, is can we collect that? The challenge with it is that you can't trace the mouse as it's developing the precancer stage. So you can detect them when you sack the mouse, but you can't get it all the way through. And so you end up with exactly the same problem as the human that you can't track it all the way right through in the same individual. Um, it'll be better than we can get in humans because obviously we're not going to do the, that type of longitudinal sampling in patients, but um, I don't know how to overcome that. So we're thinking maybe barcoding strategies. Um, again, the organoid, we can do live cell imaging. So I think for proof of can we parameterize, can we fit to real data if we could get time source data, I think the organoid models are going to be really valuable. And then also a model in 3D. Yes. And I think in general, like if something can be, for the learning, if something <laughs> can be done by imaging somehow, that will be then implementable in the clinic because you cannot, like, really, if you are thinking about implementing some type of surveillance strategy or screening, like, you cannot really biopsy healthy people to privacy. Yeah. I think this is going to have to, I, I really do think this is going to have to go to imaging. I think, you know, and there's been very compelling work recently of um, learning more and more immune features from radiomics. Um, so I think it's, the technologies are getting better. And I think the availability of matched data sets is getting better, that it should be feasible. I know nothing about radiomics, but I really do want to learn for this reason, just try to start thinking about this. At any rate, like, it probably, I think as far as I understand, they're pretty good at um, monitoring something like metabolic. Exactly. You probably can map <laughs> your immune cells to some specific metabolic. Exactly. Or, or like if you have a tumor density, right? Like, yeah, I think, I think, can you get the metabolic link and especially with you know, getting a metabolic estimate in, in, from transcription, can you start to use that as the bridge? Did you ever have multiple image data per patient where data don't really reconcile well or have similar um, profiling from another? Do you reconcile that? Like, do you see that as different points? Even in the same and in one snapshot, right? So I didn't talk about this work today, but we've done other work in um, liver neoadjuvant clinical trials. And there we had half of the tumor was frozen and half of it was FPE. And we did the spatial transcriptomics profiling before <clears throat> the FPE-based technologies. And what we observed was basically completely different um, cellular compositions within some of the samples of them. But what was interesting was when we dug in and looked at the spatial transcriptomics, um, and this paper just came out, 
what we found is that one of the liver lesions actually had two distinct tumor regions in it. And one of them had huge immune infiltration and the other one didn't. And when we dug into the one that didn't, <clears throat> it had this huge stem cell and fibroblast per signature that seemed to be blocking the immune infiltration. And when it's the first time I got a cohort in my clinic and I showed, we showed the results to one of my clinical colleagues and he was like, oh my God, this patient's going to recur, you know, cause they've been looking at it all in the immune profiling. And then the patient recurred like a month later and passed away from their cancer. And it was the only recurrence of a responder on the trial. So, I mean, we got lucky in a sense scientifically from our profiling, um, but I don't know how much to tease apart where we have these tumors that are so heterogeneous and we're not doing comprehensive sampling. You know, if things aren't aligning, even at a single time point, is that intratumor heterogeneity or is it a temporal shift? I don't know. So, um, yeah, I don't know what to make of all of this. And like Svetlana was saying, I think 3D starting to get to imaging data, really leveraging it and can we start working from it's going to be absolutely critical. So even with this heterogeneity, you're sort of running into the same problem as everything is running into. So you, you with any biomarker, you need to be lucky to sample it from the proper place. So yeah. You, you know, uh, Our pathology colleagues still have tremendous value. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. And then, yeah, it's not particular to this type of analysis of thinking. It's, yeah. I mean, as data scientists, we always get what we get, unfortunately. Thanks, everybody.